हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पाठशाला टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस मॉड्यूल एट ऑफ इंडियन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन व्हिच डील्स विद कंट्रोल ओवर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन एंड द टॉपिक वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस विल बी इन दिस फॉर्म दैट व्हाट इज द नीड फॉर द कंट्रोल ओवर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन व्हाट आर द वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन हाउ द एग्जैक्टिव एक्सरसाइज कंट्रोल ओवर द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन हाउ लेजिस्लेचर एक्सरसाइज कंट्रोल ओवर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन एंड हाउ द जुडिशरी एक्सरसाइज कंट्रोल ओवर एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन so to begin with we'll start with what are what is the need for the control over administration now the control over administration is necessary to check against the despotic exercise of power by the bureaucrat uh, the instrument of such control should blend apparently two conflicting interest protecting the rights and the civil liberties of individual without curbing the power and the discretion which has been given to the bureaucrats now broadly speaking there are two types of control which can be exercised over administration one is the internal control and the second is the external control and as the name suggest internal control means the control which can be exercised from within the machinery it is inbuilt in the administration and being inbuilt in the me this mechanism being inbuilt in the system it goes or moves on with the movement of the administrative machinery now so far as external control is concerned external control again as the name suggest means any outside control which is exercised over the administration now so far as external control is concerned it is being exercised through three agencies that is the legislature the executive and the judiciary now the fourth type of control which is of a recent origin is that of the control through lokpals beginning with the legislative control over administration legislative control over administration is exercised through various means first is the general control second is budgetary system and the third is control through committee now so far as general control is concerned general control over the policies and the actions of the government take place by asking questions discussions motions and resolutions when the parliament session is on now there are various ways in which the question is asked first is question hours usually the first hour of every parliamentary sitting is reserved for the exercise and during this time mp's ask questions which ministers have to reply such questions are of three kinds start questions unstart questions and sh short term notice questions now questions are effective control over legislative of legislative control over administration and keep the civil servants alert and on their toes excessively cautious and careful to maintain record of what they are doing then comes a zero hour zero hour is not mentioned in the rules of procedure this is an informal device through which the members of the parliament can raise matters without any prior notice the zero hour starts immediately after the question hour and remain in force till the agenda of the day is taken up then comes half an hour discussion now it is meant for raising a discussion on the matters of public importance which has subjected to a lot of debate and the answer to which needs clarification on the matter of facts the speaker can allot 3 days in a week for such discussion there is no formal notion or voting before the house then comes short discussion short duration discussions now it is also known as to our discussion as the time allotted for such discussion is usually 2 hours and it will not exceed 2 hours then come other discussions now in addition to above discussions there are various occasion available to the members of parliament to raise discussions and debates to examine and to ex to criticize the administration for its lapses and failure now these includes inaugural speech of the president in the introduction of several bills for the enactment of laws and introduction and passing of the resolution on public interest then the third kind of motion is the call attention motion now it is the notice introduced in the parliament by the member to call the attention of ministers to the matter of urgent public importance and seek a reasonable statement from him on that matter then the adjournment motion now it is introduced in the parliament to draw the attention of the house to the matter of urgent public importance this motion needs the support of at least 50 members to be admitted as it interrupts the normal business of the house it is regarded as extraordinary practice it involves an element of censure against the government and hence the rajya sabha is not permitted to make the use of this device no confidence motion 
Article 75 of the Constitution provides that Council of Ministers shall be collectively responsible to the par at Lok Sabha. Now, it means that the ruling party remain, can remain in power only so long as it continues to enjoy the confidence of the majority of the members of the Lok Sabha and members of Lok Sabha can remove the ministry from the office by passing a no-confidence motion. The motion needs the support of at least 50 members to be admitted. Then comes censor motion. A censor motion is different from no confidence motion. And the point of distinction are, so far as censor motion is concerned, it should state the reason for the adoption in Lok Sabha. Whereas, in case of no confidence motion, it need not state the reason for adoption in Lok Sabha. Secondly, it, so far as censor motion is concerned, it can be moved against individual member or a group of minister or against an entire council of minister. But so far as no confidence motion is concerned, it can be moved against the entire council of minister. Thirdly, it is moved for censoring the council of minister for specific policies and action. Whereas in case of no confidence motion, it is moved to ascertain the confidence of Lok Sabha in the council of ministers. Censor motion, if it is passed in the Lok Sabha, the council of minister need not resign from the office. Whereas if the no confidence motion is passed, then the minister, ministers must resign from the office. The second mode of parliamentary control over administration is exercised through budgetary system. Now this is the most important and the effective tool for the control over administration. The parliament controls the revenue and the expenditure of the government through enactment of budget. It is ultimate authority to sanction the raising and the spending of the government fund. It can criticize the policies and the action of the government and point out the lapses and the failure of administration during the process of enactment of budget. Unless the appropriation and the financial bill they are passed, the executive cannot incur expenditure and can collect taxes respectively. And the third mode of control which is exercised by the parliament over the administration is audit system and control through the committees. Now this is an important tool of parliamentary control over administration. And for this the controller and auditor general is appointed and controller and auditor general on behalf of the parliament audits the account of the government and submits the annual report known as uh, audit report about the financial transaction of the government. The report of CAG highlights the improper, illegal, unwise, uneconomical and irregular expenditure of the government. The CAG is an agent of the parliament and hence he is responsible only to the parliament. Thus, the financial accountability of the government to the parliament is secured through audit report of CAG. Now, the work done by the parliament is voluminous, however, the time which is at the disposal of the parliament is very less. So, in order to, so it cannot devote much time over each and every issue. A good deal of the business in the parliament is therefore transacted through a parliamentary committee. Now, the parliamentary committee, parliamentary committees, they are of two kinds, ad hoc committees and the standing committees. As the name suggests, ad hoc committees are those committees which have been constituted for a specific purpose and they ceases to exist when the purpose is over. Whereas the standing committees, they are being constituted on the permanent basis and they remain in force for a particular, uh, so long as they are appointed for a particular term. Now, so far as uh, the ad hoc committees, they are concerned, some of the ad hoc committees are select and the joint committees on bill, railway convention committee, the committee on draft five-year plan and Hindi equivalent committee. Besides ad hoc committee, each house of the parliament has a standing committee like the business advisory committee, the committee on petition, the committee on privileges and the rules committee. Besides the ad hoc and the standing committee, there is also a provision for other types of committees and of special importance, uh, they are the committees on subordinate legislation, the committees on government assurances, the committee on estimates, the committee on public accounts and the committee on public undertakings and departmental related standing committees. The committee on estimate, the committee on public accounts, the committee of public undertakings, they play important role in exercising a check over the government till expenditure and policy formulation. The second mode of control over administration is exercised through executive. Executive control is exercised by the political executive that is the cabinet and the minister over the bureaucrats.
Now, executive exercises control over administration through the following means. First is policy making, budgetary system, personnel management and control, delegated legislation, civil services code, staff agencies and appeal to public opinion. So these are the various ways in which the access, executive exercises are control over administration. Starting with the political or the policy making, in India the cabinet formulates administrative policy and directs, supervises and coordinates the implementation of such policies. The minister who is in charge of one or more department lays down the departmental policy and directs, supervise and coordinates the implementation by the administrator. Thus, through political direction, the minister controls the operation of administrative agencies working under the various ministries and departments. Now, the departmental officials are directly and totally responsible to the ministers. Second system is the budgetary system. Now, the executive controls the administration through budgetary system. It formulates the budget, get it enacted by the parliament and allocates the necessary funds to the administrative agencies to meet their expenditure. In all such activities, the Ministry of Finance plays an important role. It exercises a control over the administration in the following ways. Approval of policies and the programs in principles, acceptance of provisions in the budget estimates, sanctioning expenditures subject to the power which are delegated, providing financial advice through integrated financial advisors, reappropriation of the grants, that is the transfer of funds from one subhead to another, then the internal audit system and prescribing a financial code to be followed by the spending authorities. Then the third mode is the appointment and the removal uh, of the personnel management and control. This is the most effective means of executive control over administration. The executive plays an important role in personnel management and control and enjoy the power of appointment and removal of the top administrative heads. In this function, the executive is assisted by the Department of Personnel and Training at the Ministry of Finance and Union Public Service Commission. The Department of Personnel and Training is the central personnel agency in India and plays a major role in personnel management and control. At the highest level, the ministers plays an important role in the selection and the appointment of secretaries and the head of the departments. Thus, they exercise full control over the administration of the department under their charge through such appointees. Another mode of exercising the control is through delegated legislation. Now, as we all know, delegation, le delegated legislation is also known as subordinate legislation. Now, it is an important tool in the hands of the executive to exercise control over administration. The parliament makes law in the skeleton form and in and the rest of that is rest of the policies, bylaws and the rules and the regulations, they are being supplied by the executive. Therefore, the executive makes rules, regulations which have been observed by the administrator in the executor, execution of the law concern. Then another mode of exercising control is through ordinances. The constitution of India authorizes the president to promulgate ordinances during the recess of the parliament to make the situation demanding immediate action. An ordinance is, an, uh, is as authoritative, as, a power, as powerful as a parliament, as an act of parliament and hence governs the functioning of the administration. Another mode of exercising control is through civil service code. The executive has prescribed a civil services code to be observed and followed by the administrator in the exercise of their official powers. It consists of set of the conduct rules which prevent the administrator from misutilizing their personal end. Now, the important among such rules are All India Service Conduct Rules 1954, Central Civil Services Conduct Rules 1955 and the Railway Services Conduct Rules 1956. Now, they all deal with the various things like loyalty to the state, obeying the official orders of the superior, political activities of the civil servants, financial transactions of the civil servants, material restrictions and others. Then comes the staff agencies. The executive also exercises the control through staff agencies. Some of the important staff agencies in India are Department of Administrative Reforms, the Planning Commission, the Cabinet Secretariats and the Prime Minister Office. Now the staff agencies exercise influence and indirect control over administrative agencies and plays an important role in coordinating their policies and programs. Last but not the least, another mode of exercising the control which is of a recent development is that of the control through Lokpals. Now uh, these are appointed by the governments and they exercise control over the high officials. Then another mode of exercising the control over administration is through judiciary. 
judiciary out here means the higher judiciary that is the high court and the supreme court now these court can also exercise a control over administration this control can be exercised through two modes one is through the power of judicial review which is inherent in the constitution which is given to the judiciary and second is through an extraordinary remedies which is available in the form of writs now so far as power of judicial review is concerned the judicial control over administration emanates from the concept of rule of law according to dicey the rule of law signifies three concepts but interrelated one first is that the supremacy of law second is equality before law and the third is predominance of the legal spirit the first is supremacy of law supremacy of law is the first principle of rule of law it signifies predominance of a regular law as a opposed to the prevalence of wide arbitrary and discretionary power it negates the existence of arbitrariness in any form in the sovereign prerogative second is equality before law equality before law means equal protection of law to all and everybody is equal before law so that means equal subjection of all the citizen whether they are rich poor high low official non official to an ordinary law of land and administered by the ordinary law courts third is predominance of the legal spirit the primacy of the rights of the individual that is the constitution is the result of right of individual as defined and enforced by the court of law rather than the constitution being the source of individual rights thus the rights of the citizens of great britain flow from the judicial decisions not from the constitution the indian constitution has not accept, accepted the maxim that the king can do no wrong and all the administrative authorities are subjected to the jurisdiction of ordinary civil courts of the land moreover no person can be deprived of his life and the personal li liberty except by the procedure adopted by the or established by the law additionally all rules regulations bylaws are covered by the term law and can be challenged before the court of law which can struck down as unconstitutional now the judiciary exercises the control through the following modes first as i have already said the power of judicial review the power of judicial review is the process in which the court can pronounce upon the validity of an action which is taken by the executor judicial review is inherent in the administrative process and it is the basic structure of the constitution and thus cannot be abrogated even by amending the constitution it is the power of the court to examine the legality and the constitutionality of administrative act on examination if the court find that any any of the act which is taken by the administration is ultra vires then it can struck it struck it down and declare it as unconstitutional or invalid by the court ultra vires here means ultra and vires ultra means beyond and vires means bar so any act which is done which is beyond the power which is given to him can be struck down as ultra vires and has void ab initio second this is also precisely known as doctrine of ultra vires <laughs> then comes uh, uh, the power of judicial review of administrative action which is whether it has been constitutionally recognized or not now the constitution of india itself incorporates a number of provisions for incorporating judicial control over administration writs are issued by the supreme court and the high court under the provisions contained in article 226 and 32 of the constitution respectively now under article 227 of the constitution the high court exercises the power of supervision over the tribunals and other adjudicatory bodies within the territorial jurisdiction now provisions for appeal to the supreme court from the decision of tribunal and the courts has also been made under article 136 of the constitution besides these constitutional provisions several statutes confer power on the court to control the action of the administration now effect of all this is that no administrative action can be held free from the judicial review the power of judicial review guaranteed by these constitutional provisions they are very wide and comprehensive but it is for the court to lay down the rules for self limitation of its own power the power cannot be cut down by the legislation as it is conferred by the constitution which no legislation has power to override the courts have in fact expanded the scope of judicial review of administrative action by the following ways first expanding the scope and ambit of natural justice expanding the concept of tribunals for the purpose of article 136 liberalizing the concept of locus tendi to file writs applying the writ system to non statutory and even non official or the bodies developing the concept of molding the remedies expanding the scope of writs of certiorari and mandamus liberalizing 
liberal interpretation of article 32 and 226 and most importantly promoting the concept of public interest litigation then comes what is the distinction between the judicial review and judicial control now so far as judicial review is concerned it has a restrictive connotation as compared to judicial control that is judicial control is much more wider term judicial review is supervisory rather than corrective in nature judicial review is donated by the writ system which is provided under article 32 and 226 of the constitution judicial control on the other hand is much broader term it donates a much broader concept and includes judicial review within its ambit judicial control comprises of all the methods through which the person can seek relief against administration through the medium of courts such as appeals writs declarations injunctions damages statutory remedies against the administration another mode of exercising the control by the judiciary is through the issuance of rates this is an extraordinary remedies as already has i have said that they are available Rits can be issued only by the higher judiciary that is the high court and the supreme court and the same has been given the power under article 226 and article 32. Now uh, these consist in fact of six kinds of writs. They are habeas corpus, the writ of mandamus, prohibition, certiorari, quaverento and injunction. First five of these writs that is habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, certiorari and qua warranto they are provided in the constitution and the sixth writ which is in the form of injunction is provided under the specific relief act and it is a form of an equitable relief now starting with the habeas corpus habeas corpus literally means have the body by issuing this writ the court orders the person of the authority who has detained another person to bring him before the court so that the court may decide on the validity and the justification of such detention that this is a prompt and the effective remedy against all form of unlawful restraint the object of this writ is not to punish the detaining authority rather it is to free the person who has been unlawfully detained this remedy is available against anybody and not necessarily against a police official who has unlawfully detained another person Apart from the prisoner himself, any person interested as for instance his wife, parent, sister or even a friend can apply for this writ. Delay in applying for this writ is not of itself a good ground for refusing a relief. As a right of personal liberty is the most cherished right in any civilized society, it cannot be defeated by any length of time. As unlawful detention is also a continuing wrong, the question of delay is not at all relevant in such cases. The second kind of writ which is which can be issued by the court, High Court under Article 226 and uh, under Article 32, the Supreme Court can issue these writs is that of a mandamus. Mandamus literally means we command. It is the command issued by the court to the public official asking him to perform his official duties which he has failed to perform. Then the third kind of writ which is available is in the form of prohibition. It literally, means, it literally means to forbid. It is issued by the higher court to the lower court when the latter exceeds its jurisdiction. So it can be exercised only against a judicial and quasi-judicial authorities and not against an administrative authorities. Hence it is important as a tool of judicial control over administration is a highly restricted. Then comes shashurari. It is literally means to be certified. It is issued by the higher court to the lower court for transferring the records or proceedings of the case pending with it for the purpose of determining the legality of its proceedings and for giving fuller and more satisfactory effect to them than could be preventive as well as curative. Like prohibition, it can be issued only against a judicial and quasi-judicial authorities and not against administrative authorities. Then comes quaverento. It literally means by what authority or warrant. It is issued by the court to inquire into the legality of the claim of the person who is holding a public office. 
that is by what authority he is holding the public office therefore it prevents illegal assumption of public office by any person so we can uh, safely conclude that the power of judicial review of administrative action is inherent in our constitutional scheme which is based upon rule of law and separation of power it is considered to be the basic feature of the constitution which cannot be abrogated even by exercising a constituent power of the parliament it is most effective remedy which is available against administrative excesses well it is a positive sense among the masses that if administration undertakes any work or acting under the discretionary power conferred upon it by the statutory rules or under the provisions of the constitution if it is a failure to exercise discretion or abuse of a discretionary power to settle its score or gain any private profit due to the discretionary power then only option which is available to the public is to go to the judiciary under article 226 Article thirty-two and one thirty-six of the Constitution of India. The main purpose of judicial review is to ensure that the law enacted by the legislation conform to the rule of law. Judicial review has certain inherent limitations. It is more suited for adjudication of a dispute than for performing administrative functions. It is for the executive to administer the law, and function of the judiciary is to ensure that the government carries out its duties in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution of India. Though we have discussed the judicial control over administrative action, there are certain limitations so far as judicial control over administrative action is concerned. Now, the courts can always exercise its discretion to refuse, even in the cases where legal rights of petitioners appears to have been violated, if it has effective alternative remedy elsewhere, as for instance, an appeal which he can avail of. However, this is not the rule of jurisdiction. it is the rule of practice of the policy and convenience in other words there is no absolute bar to relief in all cases where an alternative remedy is available but the courts of their own can limits their jurisdiction and can say that in case any other alternative remedy is available the person instead of exercising instead of coming to the court for the exercise of the power under article 32 or 226 or for that matter 136 can avail alternative remedy instead of approaching the court then second is the disputed question of law disputed question of fact now generally speaking the supreme court and the high court do not exercise the direct jurisdiction in cases involving disputed question of fact in such cases the court prefers to leave the parties to litigate the matter in a civil court once again there is this too is a question of discretion and not of the jurisdiction and each case is to be decided on its own fact and surrounding circumstances any person seeking a prerogative writ must make fullest possible disclosure of all the relevant fact it is based on the maxim that he who seeks the equity must comes with a clean hand an applicant who invokes the writ jurisdiction of the court must truthfully disclose all the relevant facts as the very basis of writ jurisdiction is the correct disclosure of relevant fact an applicant cannot pick and choose some fact and refuses to disclose the other if he does not make the fullest possible disclosure the writ petition is liable to be dismissed on the ground alone as once observed by the supreme court any person who invokes the extraordinary jurisdiction of the court should not attempt to misuse this valuable right by suppression by misrepresentation by misstatement or concealment of the material facts then another way where the this remedy is not available could be in the policy matters policy matters are not meant to be examined by the court exercising its writ jurisdiction as once observed the writ court can neither treat an unknown path nor propel into uncharted ocean of the government policy then the matters involving a public private rights now the remedy made available by article 32 and 226 is a public law remedy and not the private law remedy therefore it cannot be invoked to obtain a relief in cases of alleged violation of a private rights of the petitioner besides this there are certain other factors and other uh, Uh, limits factors limits the effectiveness of judicial control over administration and they are firstly the judiciary cannot intervene in the administrative process on its own the court intervenes only when the aggrieved citizen takes a matter before the court therefore the judiciary lacks a suo motu power 
Secondly, the control exercised by the court is in the nature of post-mortem control. That is, they intervene after the damage is done to the citizen by the administrative act. Thirdly, all administrative acts are not subject to the judicial control as a parliament may exclude certain matters from the jurisdiction of the court. Fourthly, self-denying ordinances, that is, the judiciary denies to itself jurisdiction in certain matter. The court refuses to intervene in certainly certain purely administrative matters on its own accord. Then the judicial process is very slow, cumbersome as well as very expensive. Then the judges being legal expert cannot fully and properly understand the highly technical nature of the administrative act. Then the volume, the variety, the complexity of the administration has increased due to the welfare orientation of the state. Hence, the court cannot review each and every administrative effect affecting the citizens. So, we can conclude that the power of judicial review and the power issue rates can be exercised by the court for exercising the control over administration, but there are certain important limitations also, which judiciary always take into mind before exercising, before exercising control over the administrative act. And this is a positive point on the point of judiciary. And this is uh, all what we have to deal so far as the various kind of control over the administrative acts are concerned. Thank you.